Hi, my name is Michael Fechner and I work for SEQ Water and today I'd like to talk to you about something I'm quite passionate about and that's water. Um, some of you live uh, in areas where you may get water from a dam through a treatment plant. Others of you may live in an area where you rely on tanks to get your water. The reality is this item here is one of the most important things on our planet because without it we can't exist. So it's really important to be, in, to be able to understand it and look after it and, and understand how it operates within our lives. Um, as I said, I, I think we tend to take it for granted. Um, as I said, here in the city we turn the taps on and water comes out and uh, we, we just expect it to keep coming. Uh, and yet there's very little knowledge about what exists um, to, to ensure that water comes to us every day. Now within South East Queensland, um, we have quite a significant network uh, of water distribution and supply and I'd like to tell you a bit about that um, and how important it is. Back in the Millennium Drought, back in the early 2000s, um, our dams, 26 of our dams we have, 12 of them are connected, but uh, our dams got down to about 12% and they told us that we had probably just 12 months of water remaining, which was a big problem. So the government undertook a massive campaign and uh, work to connect 12 of our 26 dams by pipeline, 600 kilometres of pipelines. Um, uh, a new dam was built and also manufactured water to be able to supply water into southeast Queensland. Now, um, that obviously has to some degree drought proof southeast Queensland, but still we have difficulties. Um, the region from um, maybe uh, Brisbane going north on the Sunshine Coast is an area where there's going to be an incredible amount of population in the future. And uh, do we have enough water in that space? Probably not. We've got small dams um, and where it rains off the coast, it provides water into those dams, but those dams empty very quickly. Um, on the southern region, um, we have the Gold Coast with the Hins Dam. And then out here, we have uh, Wyvernhoe and Somerset Dam, which supply most of Brisbane. Now, you imagine getting up tomorrow morning and finding no water coming out of your taps in any form or fashion. That would change things dramatically. Walk into a Woolworths, an Aldi or a Coles and um, any of the vegetables that are there would not be there because we wouldn't have water to, to grow them. I like to think about it as visible and invisible water. You and I, we have showers, we wash, we use a toilet, we clean and the water that comes out of those taps is quite visible. But the reality is that there's a whole lot of invisible water that we don't really see or understand. Um, the very good example is an egg. Um, you'd probably find it very uh, difficult to understand that it takes 97 litres of water to produce one egg. Um, and no, 97 litres can't fit into that egg. But the reality is that the supply chain leading up to that egg from the chicken through to the grain, to the growing of that grain requires water. And we don't think about that. When you go home tonight and sit down to a dinner plate of food, the chances are that your plate will have taken around about 3,660 litres of water to produce. And that's, that's incredible to think about, but it's visible and invisible water. So the water on our planet is quite incredible. The same amount of water that we have now is the water that was here at the dinosaurs time. Um, we, we can't make any more, it's there, it may be in ice, it might be in snow, it might be in salt water, but the reality is that it's, it's all there cycling around and in year two you may have learned about the water cycle and how obviously rain falls, it evaporates, condenses and comes down again. The rain moves around our planet in, in, in large quantities, sometimes it's flooding, sometimes it's drought, but the reality is it's the same amount of water. So. What do we need to think about to understand that water in a much better way? Well, as I said to you, back in 2000, early 2000s, we had a, a drought here in southeast Queensland, the Millennium Drought, and our dams got down, as I said, to about 12%. Um, we built a lot of infrastructure, but the reality is we can't rely on the rain. If it doesn't rain, dams don't fill up. So what do we do? How can we go about supplying water to a population? The government at that time built a desalination plant on the Gold Coast and it now supplies water into southeast Queensland. So they take water from about two kilometres offshore of Chugan on the Gold Coast. They uh, treat that water, <clears throat> take the salt out of it, and we end up with drinking water. Uh, and that water is now supplied into Brisbane. And in the last number of weeks, before we had the bit of rain recently, 
um, we were still in a drought situation. Our dams were down to about 60% and we were on the downhill slide into another drought time. We did have a little bit of rain, but don't let that fool you. It hasn't, it's only topped up the dams a little bit and some parts of Queensland are still in, in terrible drought and uh, that will continue to do so. We live on the, the most, the, the driest inhabited continent on our planet. Um, no other, no other continent is as dry as what our continent is with people living on it. So we need to be able to understand our water use and how we can go there. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about that for, for a little while. Um, we're going to do an activity shortly, but uh, have a think about that situation at the moment, have a discussion around it and have a look at um, some materials. I have a couple of videos that I'd like to show you, which your teacher will show you now. One talks about drought. Um, and it talks also about Essex Water and how we supply water into South East Queensland. Quite interesting and it sets the scenes for the tasks we're going to do in a little while. So if you could uh, take the time to have a look at those next and I'll come back and talk to you soon. South East Queensland uses about 300,000 megalitres of water a year, which is about 120,000 Olympic swimming pools. Roughly 70% of that water is used for residential purposes. That's about 165 litres of water per person per day and more in summer. The water we use starts its journey as rain. Water flows into a dam from rain falling in the area around it called a catchment. SEQ Water has 26 dams and 51 weirs to store the water we need to use when we need it. Dams and weirs also help mitigate floods and also provide the community with popular recreation facilities. We live in a climate of extremes. The volume of rain and where it falls can be unpredictable. We have long droughts punctuated by extreme floods. With our increasing population and changing climate, there is more pressure on our water supplies than ever before. The SEQ Water Grid is our connected network of water catchments, storage dams, treatment plants, reservoirs and pipelines. SEQ Water also have two climate resilient sources of water the Gold Coast Desalination Plant and the Western Corridor Recycled Water Scheme. No matter where you are in the region, it's important we develop good water habits so we have enough to meet future demand. Everyone has a role to play in using water wisely, so there's enough for everyone. Okay, well, I hope you had a look at that uh, little video and saw what SEQ Water does and how important the whole process is of supplying water to South East Queensland. And it's not dissimilar all over, all over Australia. Um, we are a bulk water supplier. We own the dams, the water treatment plants, and we supply water which then is passed on to the public and ultimately to your house. But as I said, if you live out in the country areas, your water comes from the rain. And if it doesn't rain, you know you don't have to get any. Well, so the discussion we had was what happens when we don't have water? What happens if we don't have enough water and we know that uh, you know society can really come to a bit of a halt if we don't have water because it, it, it's, it's in so many different things. Um, 2018 was an interesting year because uh, Cape Town in South Africa um, approached what they call day zero. Now Cape Town ran out of water. Um, a rather large city ran out of water and uh, they had to deal with immense problems. They used to go to service stations in the morning and uh, they were limited to about 90 litres of water per family per day. Could your family operate on 90 litres of water per day? Interesting one. We don't have to go overseas though to actually uh, to think about that. Um, before Christmas in 2019, Stanthorpe and the region on the Granite Belt ran out of water just before Christmas. Um, the dam, Storm King Dam out there, had not had rain for many, many months, years, and it was dry. The dam, Leslie Dam near Warwick, also was very dry, but Stanthorpe got to day zero. In our, in our own country here, um, and many countries around that um, highlands area of northern New South Wales, uh, in the central region and up into uh, uh, the area around Stanthorpe and Queensland, they both, they all have uh, had water difficulties, and it's not something that um, is going to go away anytime soon. But Stanthorpe ran out of water and it had to be trucked in. Um, it had to be bought in in bottles, schools and others supplied water to the town. And it's an ongoing situation. Um, the rain that we've had recently has not provided um, enough water for that place. So uh, um, they're going to continue to have struggles. Um, 
we have talked about extending the pipeline from southeast Queensland to there, but again, it relies on rain filling our own dams up. Um, and another another thing. So, what do we do in that time? I want you to have a look at a video now, um, uh, entitled uh, Day Zero. Listen to the South African scene and take some knowledge from there. And we'll come back then, and we're going to discuss what we can do as a world to supply water into the future. I think the question on everyone's minds is, how did Cape Town get here? 2013, which is only five years ago, we had the record rainfall year. We had lots and lots of water. Dams were full. 2014, we had a drop in those dams. When we got to 1st of October, which is the end of the rainy season in 2015, we had dams that were 78% full. In 2016, they were 58% full. In 2017, they were 38% full. Who knows what they're going to be at the end of the 2018, this year's rainy season. What does it look like when the taps run dry? 10,000 people running down a highway, burning tires, stopping traffic to protest at the fact that they're not getting their service delivery, airports being cut off, uh, tourism closing down, people choosing not to visit here, uh, unemployment shooting through the roof, uh, petroleum closing down, the harbour closing down, ships can't come here, they can't get refills of water. And that's what they come here for, apart from offloading and unloading. Mass exodus of the people who can afford to move out, move out. Meaning that uh, much less money gets spent in the centre. It is a catastrophe. And we've got to start using the right wording. It's a catastrophe, it's not a crisis. A crisis is a, is, a, is a temporary oops. A catastrophe is when the police are moving into the, the, the distribution points. The army is moving into the distribution points. Your water will be given to you under the, uh, the protection of a gun. That's heavy stuff. That's a completely different story. It's an Armageddon type scenario. We cannot afford to get to that place anywhere in the world. And this is an absolute uh, disaster waiting to happen on both sides. When they do communicate, all they do is they're reflecting blame from, from, from one party to the other, from, from national to provincial to back, or national to, to, to municipal. This is not helping anybody at all. You know, we're just simply not listening to science. As we say, day zero seems to be on the horizon. It's at all. It's entirely a man-made disaster because uh, the information that has been available to the scientific community has suggested that this is going to happen for some time now, and it's simply been ignored with a plan, because right now uh, the plan that there is, I'm afraid, is, is, is not very well thought through. We've been through so much in this, in this country, it's a hard life. Uh, we've come from a difficult past, we're going into a difficult future. It might just be that no water, or very little water, or zero water, is the thing that actually brings us together. The rest of the world will look to Cape Town for what we did wrong, are doing wrong, and what we did right and are doing right. And that will be the blueprint going forward for eternity. Okay, well, uh, as you saw from that small video about uh, Cape Town in South Africa, it was a serious scenario. It was very, very serious. Um, the, the interesting thing is, um, after they approached Day Zero, the dams ran out and the people were getting water at service stations with soldiers protecting it, um, it rained. It rained very severely and they had floods there. Uh, but that, that's about our climate change in our world. And as I said, we can't rely on the rain. In southeast Queensland, it was very similar. Um, we had the millennium drought. And then at the end of the millennium drought, after we'd built a lot of infrastructure to drought proof us, it poured rain. 
and there was a lot of discussion then as to whether we had done the right thing by um, building a lot of those things that weren't necessarily needed then, that water comes on a cycle. Well, we know that the climate in our planet is changing, on our planet is changing. We can't rely on the rain. What are we going to do? Well, there are a number of options. Um, the first one is dams. Um, we can obviously build new dams. Dams are, are there to collect water. As I said, SEQ Water, we look after 26 of them. Um, we collect dams. Um, 100 years ago, dams uh, existed as small ponds, maybe. Now they are huge um, structures that hold back many, many, many hundreds, if not millions of litres of water. Uh, and we use those. They take up a very large footprint, a very large footprint. Um, during the Millennium Drought, they wanted to build a dam on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, from an environmental point of view, many environmentalists jumped up and down and said, well, it was the wrong place to build it. Uh, and that dam got stopped. So they, didn't, they weren't able to build it. Um, dams are by far the cheapest form of, um, of I suppose, water supply. Uh, and they are what we've used for many, many years. Um, it depends on uh, somewhere to rain and it depends on water supply. You can have a beautiful dam, but if it doesn't rain, it's absolutely of no use whatsoever. And it takes up a very, very large footprint. Wyvernhoe Dam, for example, has a catchment of over 2,500 square kilometres. That means where it rains north and around it, the water flows into it. Um, you need to build it in a place where there is the capability of a good catchment and also the capability of good rain. The dams, as I said on the Sunshine Coast, collect water coming off the coast as the clouds blow in, which is really good. But dams inland a bit further, they might not get uh, rain as, as, uh, as, as often as, as is required to fill them up. So while dams are a very good opportunity um, and the cheapest option, they don't necessarily provide the answer because at the end of the day, they're climate dependent. Climate dependent, which means that they depend on the rain. So where we go next? Well, as I said to you in the, uh, the Millennium Drought, we built desalination plants. Now, desalination plants are by far probably the most expensive form of manufactured water that we can have. Um, they can be built on a very small footprint. They are required to be close to the ocean, but they you do use uh, quite a lot of energy. They're energy um, uh, dependent also. So um, this by far is the most expensive of, of water supply methods desalination because uh, it requires a lot of energy to to produce the pumps and the process of reverse osmosis which we'll talk about a little bit later on so um, we could use desalination um, the issue of uh, the uh, byproduct the uh, the uh, brine that is left over has always been something that environmentalists have been worried about uh, in Queensland our plant only produces about 125 130 megs of water a day but in places like the Middle East, in Dubai, desalination plants there produce over a thousand megalitres, a thousand million litres a day. And uh, that produces a lot of byproduct of brine which goes into the ocean, which can cause problems. In southeast Queensland, our small desalination plant um, has, has done very well and environmentally has, has stacked up quite well. But each state in Australia now has got uh, desalination plants. Um, to augment the water supply, uh, but as I said, it is a, a more expensive type. The third type of supply of water we could use would be, and this one's quite a uh, one that has not gone down well with the public, purified recycled water. Now purified recycled water is basically taking water that you would normally send to a sewage plant and get treated. Um, and retreating that water so that you can make drinking water out of it. And yes, I hear you saying yuck. If you go to Singapore, London, and a lot of other places, this is the water that you drink. Um, and look, uh, to be quite truthful, the water cycle um, is all about recycling water. So we actually already drink recycled water because the sun does not go around and choose the best water to, to evaporate. It evaporates at all, it goes into the sky, and then uh, it comes back down as rain and lands in dams and we, uh, we treat it. Um, recycled water requires um, all the waste water out of your house, of which there is only about 2% of rubbish, um, to be taken to a sewage treatment plant. At the sewage treatment plant, the poo and the pee are gone very, very quickly. 
and what you are left with is a uh, raw water and that raw water we can then take to an advanced water treatment plant where we put it through a number of stages microfiltration um, which uh, uses very small membranes to, to um, take out um, organic particles and other things. We then use something called reverse osmosis, which uh, again passes water through some fine membranes separating the, the, uh, the waste from the pure water. Um, and the pure water then is hit by uh, ultraviolet or UV light which um, kills and destroys most other pathogens, viruses and other things. And then it's treated normally in a normal, like a normal water treatment plant. So there are a number of stages that the water goes through to be able to provide pure drinking water. And as I said, this water and desalinated water are highly manufactured. And uh, one could say that uh, they're actually cleaner water than the water that comes out of dams because they are ho so highly manufactured. You can't drink this water purely from the treatment plants though because it is so pure that the minerals have been taken out of the water we need to remineralize it um, at a later stage before we can then drink it. In southeast Queensland this water was never going to be pumped directly to people it would go via a dam to come through natural processes and then be pumped out and treated again so uh, the Western Corridor pipeline within southeast Queensland that's how this would be used um, in the future. This one is about number three, uh, is, is number two in terms of expense. Desalination is the most expensive, uh, recycled water is next and then the dam is below that. So a third variety of water. The last, um, the last uh, I suppose method of looking at water management is something I call demand management. Now demand management is when you start talking to people about saving water. Um, you put into place various things that makes them, makes people actually think about and saving water. A number of years ago we had timers, uh, shower timers for four minutes um, and that helped save a lot of water. You uh, talk to people about water saving measures. Uh, when you water the garden you water in the morning or the afternoon, not in the middle of the day when uh, it's the hottest part of the day. When you, hose the, when you wash the dog or hose the driveway down, um, what do you do? It, uh, hosing the water driveway down takes a lot of water that just washes down the drain and ends up out in the ocean. Um, maybe you should rake or, or, or sweep the driveway. When you're washing the dog or washing the car, maybe you can use a bucket. When you're cleaning teeth at night, make sure you turn the tap off. So this is called demand management and it's a way of uh, educating people that uh, we need to save water and not waste it. And it's incredible what demand management has been able to do. To the shower timing, um, when we gave people shower timers, people saved a lot of water because they realised that four, four minutes in the shower is just 36 litres of water. It's still a lot of water to use for four minutes. 10 minutes in the shower is 90 litres of water. And if you have 20 minutes in the shower, 200 litres of water straight down the drain and gone, never to come back. And uh, from, for someone who works in the water industry, I get a bit worried about that because we clean water at a water treatment plant and most of it goes down the drain and gets washed away. So we can save water a whole lot more than what we are. So four methods, desalination, purified recycled water, dams and demand management. Now what I want you to do in a little while now is to, um, is to uh, your teacher is going to give you these. Um, you're going to have six different scenarios. Now the scenarios show a situation where there's geographical features. For example, here we've got the ocean, we've got a desert, and we've got four communities or four towns. What I want you to do in groups, or oh, sorry, in, in your little area there, have a pick of one of these. Now, as I said, there's, there's six different varieties of these um, that you can have a look at, um, that, that uh, look at different scenarios that have rivers, this one here has got the ocean, it's got rivers, it's got lakes, um, it shows mountain ranges and all sorts of things. What I want you to do is I want you to take a careful look at one of these and I want you to come up with the best idea that will supply water for that community. This one here for example, to give you a hint, this one here, obviously there's a desert and there's an ocean. There doesn't look to be any uh, rivers or streams there or creeks or lakes. It's a dry region because of the desert, so obviously what would be the most beneficial method to supply water to that community? Desalination probably. Um, so that would be one example. 
Um, this one here, for example, um, here you've got mountains. Now the mountain ranges, obviously when it rains on the mountains, you get runoff, you get rain coming down. So can we collect that in a dam maybe? We could. Um, you've got a river there. Maybe we take water from the river. Maybe we can recycle water here. Um, the ocean, because there are some other opportunities, you'd probably leave the ocean to last. So I want you to think about that. Now, as you go through, you're going to, if I can find it here, you're going to get this sheet here. Now, you've got to make some water choices. So down the side here, we've got the six scenarios that I've shown you, two of them. Take, have a look at each one of the six and pick which is the best scenario the best method to supply water. Now, I want you to think about it in terms of a number of things. I want you to think of it in terms of economics to start with. Which one is more expensive? And is, is it viable to, to use desalination where you've already got rivers and dams and streams? Obviously not. Um, yes, you would make it uh, uh, drought proof, but uh, you have to think about the economics. I want you to then think about the environmental problems. If I build lots of desal plants, desalination plants, is that going to affect what goes back to the ocean in terms of the brine? Um, the brine can be used for other things, but at the present moment we don't use it for a lot of things. Um, so is there going to be environmental meth issues with putting all that brine back into the ocean? Uh, for example, a dam. Now, socially, can I go and say to people, please move, we're going to build a dam here. Um, so you've got to find a place where you can build a dam, number one, but if you do build a dam, are you going to shift a whole lot of people out of the region? Is that going to create a whole lot of problems? So I want you to think about any decision you make environmentally, socially, um, economically, um, uh, and think about how the best reason. So I want you to come up with the very best, the very best um, scenario for each one of those. So. Whatever one they are, one, two, and three, and on the bottom of them you'll see the numbers. Um, down here we've got a number two. Um, on this one we've got a number one. So have a look at each one of those. Um, go through and, and have a discussion with your teacher about which might be the best options to use. Um, and you might even put them in order. For example, the first one where there's a desert, you might use desalination. You might put a one and choose which one you might put number two, three, four. So you end up with the most desirable um, method to supply water right back to the least desirable. And it might be a combination. You might need a combination of both of those to be able to do it. So just before you start that job, um, there's one more video I want to show you. Um, the video talks about these methods in terms of what they've done in Sydney. And it clarifies again the four methods, demand management, desalination, purified recycled water and dams. Have a look at that. Then I want you to go uh, and, and uh, choose a scenario and have a think about it and then fill in this sheet which uh, will give you those examples. And uh, I hope you have a good opportunity to look at what are the best ways to produce water for our communities into the future. The big challenges for Australia's urban water security going forward are related to two things in particular, as population growth and climate change. The impacts of climate change are forcing water utilities to really be able to plan effectively across four pillars of desalination, dams, water recycling and water efficiency. Desalination has been around since the millennium drought, in, particularly for Perth. And then gradually, during the millennium drought, all the capital cities put them on. For Sydney, once it was commissioned, by that stage we'd had a La Nina event and all the dams are full, they switched off, which is the right thing to do. If you don't need it, you want to use your cheapest supply. It is certainly the most expensive of the water supply options. It is an energy intensive process, but what the water utilities around Australia have done is they'll buy renewable energy certificates or they'll have agreements in place to use wind power or solar power. And I think that's the way to prove that you're serious to mitigate the greenhouse gas and carbon impacts that you're bringing to that situation. On the East Coast in particular, we're blessed by some very big dams, land and protected catchments. So we can actually keep those catchments clean. We keep people out of them, which means that the water coming into that is of, of great quality. And I think those dams will go on into the future. There's no new dam sites 
for the big metro areas. That's, that's plain and simple. Then we move to water recycling. Now there's plenty of water recycling happening right across the country. The next frontier though is potable reuse. And that happens in Singapore, it happens in the US, it happens in South Africa, and guess what, it happens in Perth too. It's effectively purified recycled water. So the sewage comes back from the homes, it comes back to a big decentralised wastewater treatment plant. It's treated to usual standards, which is a very high treatment. So by the time it, it, it comes back into the water supply, it's ready to drink and it meets all of the drinking water guidelines that you need. The next most important thing is to use water as efficiently as possible. It's a bit like the doing the right thing from the 1980s and stop littering. It's common sense now that people don't hose down hard surfaces. They're using blowers or other, other means. Also, you want to be watering your garden only in the morning or in the evening. The biggest impact, of course, that we've had is to have water efficient shower heads which not only cut down on water use, but cut down on energy use, because that's the biggest use of energy in a home, is hot water. So our big challenges, population growth and climate resiliency will be met through using those four pillars, water recycling, desalination, dams, and being water efficient. Okay, well, I hope that you came up with some great answers about that. Again, if you want to email me uh, through your teacher and have a discussion about it, I'm happy to come back to you and, and answer some more questions. Feel free to email me um, and your teacher will have my email so you can send it through to me so maybe we can um, uh, help you to get some better answers. Last task for today, um, you've got this map. This map is Southeast Queensland today and uh, what it shows is our dams, it shows our pipes, it shows our treatment plants. What I want you to do now is to do some role play. I want you to become a, uh, an SEQ water engineer for the future. And I want you to pick the best ways, having a look at this map, what would provide water for Southeast Queensland into the future. Now, as I said to you, back in 2000s, we built desalination plant on the Gold Coast. We built some recycled water treatment plants, but they're not being used at the moment because people still have an issue with that. Um, this, we built a pipeline that can move water around. Our dams are linked. What else could you do, having a look at that map, to provide water for the people of Southeast Queensland? You might even t look at your area and have a think about how might you provide water for your area into the future. What could you do? But again, think about it in terms of that economics, environment and social because um, all that has to balance together to provide the best outcome and governments have to do those sorts of things but people also have to be involved. So have a look at this map and I want you to come up with um, the best ways to provide water for South East Queensland into the future. You might make a little list of those and give me some reasons why um, and have a think about it. And again, I'm happy to answer some questions but uh, I hope today that you have uh, learned some valuable things about water and how how important it is. As I said to you, we can't live without it. We really can't. And it's, it's, a, it's a commodity that on our planet we need to look after more. It's our future in so many ways. So um, look after your water. Um, but remember also we can't rely on the rain. And uh, the realities of, of the water story is that we need to look at the future and see how we can supply water into the future to, so that we've got a safe, secure future that um, we can live in. So uh, thanks very much for listening and I look forward to getting some emails from you and, and good luck with your work. Thanks very much.